What's going on everybody? It's Fish Hook Trader here. Um, we're going to talk about a couple of different topics. I'll see if I can blend them all together. Um, or I might split them up into separate videos. Um, first, real quick, if you notice, that is a uh, replica physical Bitcoin necklace. Um, it's pretty dope. It's a gold plated chain, gold plated Bitcoin. Um, besides the one I'm wearing, I got one more available. Um, I custom made these. I mean, obviously I outsourced the pieces, but I, uh, I got them together and they are uh, just 40 bucks. Uh, shipping should be like $10. So hit me in the comments or uh, email me, thefishhooktrader.outlook.com if you want to pick one of these up. Um, I do want to say, um, I put out a couple of books myself, you know, nice, short and sweet. Um, but I will say that this is a, a decent read for anybody who is a new trader. Um, so it's called, uh, it's from the Oxford Club group, I guess. So Guide to Navigating Wall Street, um, the sixth edition. So basically it just, I mean, short and sweet, real thin. Um, you know, in the front, they just talk about, you know, who they are and all that good stuff. And in the back, it's like, how do you, uh, uh, how do you get started and all that good stuff? Four pillars of wealth. Um, there's, there's some decent stuff in here, but what I'm already teaching is actually in this book. Um, so selling cover calls, they talk about that. Uh, debit spreads obviously is uh, one of the big trades that a lot of people who, uh, who trade professionally use. Um, and I'm going to talk about one today with SPY, uh, SP500 Mini. Um, you know, in the back, they got a couple different little things here for you. Um, they got the definitions, of course, you know, for different stock terms that you may need. Um, no, I'm not affiliated with them. I'm just sharing this book. So five tax managing tips, you know, that could be good for you. Um, but anyway, it's overall, it's a pretty good book. It talks about stocks, bonds, uh, just a tad bit about options. Um, kind of like a, a entry point for new investors. So I definitely recommend reading this book. Um, it's, uh, it's not a bad read. So what we're going to talk about is... Um, I don't know what I want to blend in here, but let's talk about the market today first, right? So I got SPY up here, SPY's uh, Fidelity Active Trader Pro. Um, sorry if the thing keeps auto-focusing. I thought I took care of that, but um, what we see here is this is today. All right, these are 15-minute candles. All right, so this is the open. All right, you've opened at uh, opening price. You're looking at the uh, 286.64. Uh, last night overnight around 4 a.m. it popped, but uh, I talked about these doji candles in one of my other videos uh, Hopefully you can see this. I can't really zoom in too much here, but this red candle here um, Which looks like this All right the Brand new markers hopefully they work So this is sort of your dragonfly doji candle. All right. It almost kind of looks like a cross uh, but what you're gonna see actually relatively is that the head of it will be a lot closer to the high okay so sellers pushed it down and buyers said now nah, we're good we pushed it back up and it closed at basically the same place it opened um, this is generally a bullish candle okay so you'll see a lot of times you'll have the red candles here and a uh, dragonfly can actually be either green or red it just depends on who had the most control actually um, but say you had a couple red candles here, all right, um, and then you catch this dragonfly right on the support line, maybe, um, or an exponential moving average. You know, say it was kind of like this, and uh, I'm to suck. Um, you know, if you see this next candle, now is it always bullish? No, not necessarily. Does it indicate a possible strong bullish move? Yes. Um, and as you can see here, and um, and SPY or SPY or Spider, you know, whatever people want to call it. There is actually one nickname Spider, SPDR. Um, but you got your Dragonfly there, closing of the day. Um, I got a VMA on this one. You're looking at 284, that's here. And it actually gapped up over that and you touched on to uh, 286 at the open, okay? Um, so the high of day, um, so the high of that candle was 287. So we pushed through. The higher day looks to be right here at uh, 289.24 and uh, 289.23. So that I watched that happen, and then I calculated this move here down to the 13 EMA. Uh, but what I actually had was my Bollinger Bands. It actually went down and touched my mid band on Webull on the app. 
Um, I'll pull it up here. Uh, you see the app uh, logo here. I'll pull it up, but it's not the same on their platform. Like this is kind of dramatic, really. Um, it's actually poor quality in my opinion as far as that goes. Uh, let me see if I can rearrange this a little bit. Um, it's funny because they added the three minute charts to the mobile app, but they don't have it on the uh, platform here, which is very odd. Um, not that I can find anyway. Um, so we're gonna go one day range. Um, let's go five minute candles. And as you can see, it's extremely, um, you gotta zoom the crap out of this, right? So let's just put it back on a uh, one day and it's got a one minute chart here. All right, let's see. Let's see if I can find what I'm looking for. Okay, so let's see, that's after hours. So at the end of the day, uh, some news came out from the Fed and that's what happened here on this drop from 289 and some change uh, and it popped down here. I actually opened my debit spread right in this area that I'm about to show you on Robinhood. Uh, three minute candles look a lot better than this. Um, but what it did was it pushed down to my support line I actually already had drawn here and it actually pushed down to the lower band and it pushed back up. On the three minute, it's gonna show the middle band is where that happened at. Um, if you follow my Instagram, you'll definitely see the pictures on there. Um, it's still kind of difficult to see this. Um, that's why on doing these videos, I like to use uh, Fidelity Active Trader Pro because it makes it a lot easier to see. But you can see it right here. Um, we'll zoom in a little more. It's a less dramatic move when I'm this close, but I saw it here. I watched it hit that resistance line so we can imagine a line here. We'll go ahead and build one in. Um, let's go ahead and sit one down right here at 289. All right, uh, let me go ahead and make this thick so we can see clear as day. Hopefully you guys can see this, all right? So 289 hit, right? So when this hit, I'm like, all right, so I see the, where the resistance is at. Let me see what the low of day was. So we know that yesterday um, the stock price was at two. Um, I actually see the glare in the TV. I'm sorry about that, guys. Hopefully you guys can uh, make this out. But uh, we know yesterday it closed around 283. Um, let me drag this back just a hair. Go back. I got uh, aftermarket hours on in this right here. These are five minute candles. So, yeah, we closed over here. Uh, four o'clock, you're looking at um, the low was 283.21, closed at 283.57. All right, so I had opened one debit spread at the end of the day here, looking at that bullish trend where it was pushing against this Bollinger Band here. Again, remember when I said on the Bollinger Bands when it's pushing up, that's how you can inclinate that you're going to have a nice move uh, if the bands are getting pushed on. So again, same thing. Um, this is a uh, 15 minute chart. But what you're looking at is the band's getting pushed on here when it gapped up, right? So obviously it pushed it back down toward the middle. Remember, you can assume that there's a mid band here um, and it pushed back down, but now you're sitting on the moving average, uh, slow moving average or simple moving average 30 day. And that's what you're looking at here, okay? Um, so what we need to do is verify, okay, here's our 200 moving average, this thick yellow line here, okay? Now what we can assume that could happen tomorrow, even though you have a fair amount of uh, support right here when it appears, uh, the low on this candle, uh, not the big, huge bearish engulfing, but the very next one here, um, our low was 285.75, and the very next candle, the low was 285.98. All right, so we got some buyers kind of stepping back in. Our actual 200 moving average is 285.15. So 285 was a very good assumption if you were to took puts here and again, another test of 289.25, okay? And then you got pushed down and that news hit right at the end of the day. They're so good at that, they love it. Um, let's go back to Weeble and check that out. So, drag it back across. All right, this is the day coming in. All right, here we go. So you can see, let's move this uh, like right there, okay? And once it dropped down below that red line here, that was when we knew we were gonna drop even farther, and that's exactly what happened. All right, and I love these uh, arrows here that have the arrows on them. So, on the app, it actually points over to the price, but you can see it highlighted the price for me there. Um, 
So we have definite support here, definite support here. You, build, you hit resistance, you build support, you bounced up, you hit another resistance, okay? I know this is kind of difficult to see because that stupid glare. I have to take care of this. That's why I do videos at night. Um, comes down, hits my support, but also happens to be the uh, mid band, which is 288.66. Um, casually, uh, sorry, 288.08, right in this range, right? And then you pushed on up, hit 289.25 again on this third, fourth time today, fifth time today, all right? And then what happened was these two individual candles, some news was breaking, and sure enough, when she said what she said about the Fed and the unemployment being as most as it's ever been since the depression and all this good stuff, boom. You got a six million dollar share, not six million dollars, six million share movement here. Um, see, that's a five minute candle, so it's gonna be a little different. I'm gonna my volume up. Um, but it was a huge, huge motion selling there. All right. So we come down, we pushed on down, we hit a low right before close, 285.75. And then after hours, you touch 285.58. And now she's kind of trending across here. Okay, so now let's go to my debit spread. All right, here's my debit spread on Robin that I got here. Uh, it expires tomorrow. So we need to be between 283 and 287. All right, for this actually to be profitable, we need to close at 287 or higher, okay? Because the price was actually at 288 or 289. Uh, matter of fact, 288.40, I think, when I opened this, um, which was right around this area here. Uh, 313 is what I paid. So somewhere right in this range. And then sure enough, got that news. I could actually sell for a little profit there. Um, got that news and it just popped off. Now it went all the way down to 249. Uh, currently it is sitting at 255. Uh, currently, the price is down. Um, this option is down $58. So, as you can see, the closer it got to 287, the more my uh, my price started going down. So, I'm down 18% on this trade, and this is going to tie into uh, what we're going to talk about on the board here, and that's profit on a trade. When to take profit? Do you go by percentages? Do you cut losses by percentages? Do you go cut losses by dollar amounts, or do you cut losses by um, essentially a percentage, right? So let's go over here and check this out. Uh, what I'm expecting tomorrow is for SPY to open up again at about a median range of 284. If it gaps down, I'll lose money on this trade. Um, I made a $78 profit on the debit spread the night before. So if this one loses another $10, then or $20, basically I'll break even between yesterday and today. All right, so six o'clock just hit. That's why the screen turned black on Robinhood, because um, of course they don't trade after six o'clock. So what we can do is, uh, and I showed you, I did an app on um, setting up debit spreads, and I know this is kind of hard to see, so I'm not even gonna ask you to uh, try to follow me while I do uh, another type of trade um, built in here. Basically, you're gonna use the view all options, the view order. Um, you'll go over here, you select your contracts, so currently, if you didn't know this, one contract, all right, I don't know if you can see it, they're all right on the board. So the contract shows 255, right? So $2.55, all right? Remember, contracts always represent 100 shares. So times 100, all right, you got $255, okay? So that is how much value is still built into this debit spread. Now, I want it to close at 287 or higher. If it closes at 285 or 286 or something like that, or, or the market gaps down back to 283 in the morning, this trade's gonna lose probably half its value, and there you go. But this was a risky trade anyway because of the expiration date is tomorrow, okay? 5-6, SPY expires Monday, Wednesday, Fridays. Um, so currently we got 255 built in. Uh, we paid 313 for the trade. It's losing right now. Is it going to lose as a whole? We're not sure yet. We gotta find out and see what happens tomorrow. Um, man, it's been prep today. All right. Um, so what we're gonna talk about, basically, we'll go back to, uh, here's a PowerPoint for you guys to put it on. So we, we still got active hours here on uh, SPY. You're at 286.53 right now, which is beautiful. It's five minutes. Uh, candle bar, so that's good. I'm looking for, I'm looking for 288 or 289 again tomorrow because there was, besides the news and, and job loss. The funny thing is, when jobs, more jobs are lost, SPY and, and funds like that go up. 
and the opposite happens when jobs increase, spike goes down. So it's very interesting. Um, what we'll talk about is when to take profit on a trade, okay? Is it percentage or a dollar amount, all right? Now this is gonna depend on a few variables, okay? And what you need to understand is how big is your account? Are you on a cash account? Are you on a regular uh, pattern day trading limited account? Are you on an unlimited day trading account? As in you have $25,000 or more. Um, so all of these things matter, okay? Good gracious, there you go. All right, so that's up pretty well. Just go on and hit that. Quick. There we go. A little maintenance, no big deal. All right. So hopefully all you guys uh, made money today. You know, if you lost, hopefully you lost small. Um, you know, but again, this is this is why I preach a lot of times to not trade short expirations because what happens is if this random event occurs okay we didn't know that the fed was speaking uh, about what they were speaking about you know and articles like that right now heavily 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 impact the uh, the market as a whole so what we can do is we can assess the situation and we can try to make it work in our favor um, so do I want, I used to take profit at percentages, right? I used to only take profit on, um, you know, like 20%, 30% or something like that. And that works for a while, but it, it really varies on a lot of variables, okay? So again, account size. If you only have a thousand bucks in your account and you trade one trade to $700 and then now you're down $400 because it was a stupid trade, what are you gonna do, all right? Are you gonna hold it until you lose the rest of your money? Are you gonna take the chance, depending on your expiration, are you gonna take the chance to stick it out to see if you make your money back? Or are you just gonna cut your loss and move on? Okay, because what can happen is, say you got that thousand bucks, all right? And again, this is risk management. If you don't risk management properly, you're going to affect your account negatively, okay? So say you put $700 on that trade, okay? And now, you only have $300 available, okay? That's your cash hold right now. So say your trade, option, stock, whatever it was, you, you paid 700 bucks buying, right? So you debited 700 bucks from your account. Now, you only got that 300 left, okay? But say the $700 trade, you have a two week expiration, all right? Two week expiration, and you're looking at Shopify, okay? Shopify's got earnings coming up. Let's say that they just plank on earnings um, you know, earnings is bad, all right? And this trade, because again, you got two week expiration, say the stock price of Shopify is at 650, all right? We'll just say, for example, you bought a $700 call with your 700, you throw, throw, throw an even number there, all right? So stock price is at 650, it plummets to 620, okay? So now you're $80 away from hitting in the money, okay? Now what's gonna happen here is you're dramatically going to lose theta value. You're also gonna lose premium value because the trade went the opposite direction as what you needed it to. Therefore, you lost even more money on the trade, okay? So say now you're down, say this trade's only worth 400 bucks, right? So say you're down $300, okay? Do you cut your losses, all right, at $400, okay? Do you cut your losses at $400? Because this trade is probably not gonna happen. Now, what does happen with Shopify based on experience is that it'll swing like this, all right? Shopify makes some huge moves, just like Tesla does. So Tesla can do this. Matter of fact, they did it last week. Uh, just two weeks ago, I was deleting pictures a while ago, and Tesla was at $800 something dollars in my phone, and I'm looking at the, uh, the charts that drop back down to like low 700s, and then boom, turn around and shot back up to 760 or something today. But if it's trade swinging like this, but you only have, say this is a four week period, okay? It's four weeks, all right? And you only have a two week expiration, all right? Earnings drop, not only did you lose $300, so now you're down $300 more, okay? So now your total equity 
is only 700 bucks, all right? You only have $700 in your account now, so you lost 300 off the rip. Do you close and keep your 400, or do you wait it out, okay? Do you wait out the trade? Do you average down the trade, okay? Or do you cut your losses and move on, okay? What happens? Well, let me give you an example of something I did, all right? I had a trade that was worth um, like 700 bucks, okay? Traded up, made 100% return, $1,400, made a couple other good trades, moved on up with Shopify. This was back when it was uh, first running all over the place. Um, so I had around, whew, what was it, like 14, right, I'll give you two examples. So I had 1,400 in this one trade, all right? It, it was a little less than that. As a matter of fact, it was like 12. I had like 1200 so it was like $1,200 in the trade, all right? Uh, it was a shop deep in the money. I was buying deep in the money uh, for a one or two week expiration, all right? I watched this boy go down to negative $900, okay? I only had $300 at this point left in my account. This is my play account on Robinhood, right? Um, same one that you're seeing here. So $1,200 all the way. I watched it go down all the way to $900, all right? This is when uh, I woke up. I looked at the phone, I saw what it was. I was like, oh, man. I put the phone back down, I went back to sleep. By the end of the day, the trade was at this, at 1420. As soon as I woke up, it was like 315. I closed it out. I ended up walking away around a $200 profit. All right, and it's a shot, okay? Now, what happened the next time? All right, that's where you gotta be careful. You can't always think that the market's gonna repeat itself. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. All right, and this is what happened. So this particular other trade was, uh, I bought deep in the money. I bought, uh, I don't remember how much it cost, but I know that shop's price was 310, okay? So I bought, $330 put, okay, that's what it was. $330 put, that's what I bought. Stock price was at 310, okay. When the price went up here, that, that was what the price was at the opening morning. All right, check this out. So 310 open. I bought the 320, uh, 330 put when the price touched 319, okay. I did this simultaneously for three days. All two, all two days worked great, and then the last day did not. When it touched 319, I opened my position. Shop immediately went from 319, blew through the roof, ended up by the end of day going to 343. Okay, now check this out. I had two weeks expiration, okay, on that time frame. This had just happened when I opened the trade. My trade was down, I don't remember how much it cost, but I know it was down, I think it was like $280 out of a 900 something dollar trade, right? So the price went up to 343. Little did I know. Two days later, it ended up back down here. There you go. An example of what could have happened, okay? What did I do? Well, the price dropped down to about 330, okay? I ended up recovering half of what I lost. I closed the position out. Uh, two days later, it dropped down to 310, and that was a huge kick in the face because had I had a long expiration, guess what? That probably would not have been a big deal, okay? So what we gotta do is we need to use risk management. All right, do you want to assume that you're gonna get your money back? You can't do that in the market. That's not how this works. Um, if it's a trade that costs you 100 bucks and you got a $10,000 account or even, hell, even $2,000 account, then 100 bucks on a trade, swing along, say you got a two or three month expiration or even a couple week expiration, right? Because of some news maybe that came out or something like that. Those things, that's okay in, in a sense if you're okay with losing that money because every expiration, if your premium is not where it's supposed to be, if the strike price that you chose, put or call or whatever, if the closing price of the stock on that closing day is not above or below, pending call or put, you will lose 100% of the trade, okay? You have to keep that in mind because if you don't, you're gonna constantly lose money, all right? And I'll tell you why you're losing money on trades, okay? Many of you are choosing same week expirations, 
All right, same week expiration, same day expiration. All right, you know why a lot of you losing money? Your account's a thousand dollars. You saw Bob make eighteen hundred bucks on a five hundred dollar trade. All right, you pay nine hundred dollars on a random Tesla call because oh, it's just got to be bullish because of Elon. All right, and Tesla drops 200 bucks in two days, right? It does that all the time. It goes up and down, up and down, up and down. Guess what, dummy? You just lost all of your money, okay? If not the vast majority of it anyway. Um, say you close the trade at, you know, 20 bucks, but most people who put $1,000 on a trade, all right, and they already lost seven or $800, guess what they're not gonna do? They're not gonna cut it loose. They're not gonna save that other 100 or $200. They're gonna just let it ride. And when they're wrong on expiration day, they will lose 100% of that trade, all right? Don't be stupid. This is stupid. This is stupid, okay? If you're an experienced trader with years of experience and you understand the risk that you're getting in and you're making calculated decisions based on either price action, support resistance, big news coming in that you know about that you're so, uh, so strong-minded about that you have no problem risking your money because either A, you know you're gonna be right, or B, you're gonna make a little bit of profit, or C, maybe you cut the loss with just a tiny bit of loss because it didn't go the way you planned, all right? I was listening to an audio book on trading, all right? It was called um, Life of a Day Trader or something like that, or Living Day Trader, I don't know what it's called. Anyway, one of the things that they said in the book that stood out the most was the more your trade loses when you open it, the more wrong you were, okay? Say I open a trade, I pay $100 for this premium, you know, on my call option, uh, say we wanna call on Shopify, right? Um, cost me 100 bucks. Now say immediately, now you gotta think, bid ask prices and options can vary drastically, right? So you can go anywhere from um, 10, 20, $30 spreads to like 150, two or $300 spreads, like if it's on Amazon or something like that, right? So you gotta be very careful. So say you open this trade and you're immediately down $30, okay? Now, this doesn't necessarily mean, depending on the stock, based on volatility of the stock and the premium on the option, how short your expiration is and a couple of other things, theta and delta and all that stuff on the Greeks don't really matter when it comes to the bid-ask price, but what you need to do is prepare yourself, okay? Is this real? Did you really actually lose $30? Or did the bid ask price just flop around real quick and, you know, um, you know, take you out basically? So otherwise, if it did drop down to $70, all right, and you just entered this trade, okay, there is one or two things that I would do in this situation. All right, none of this is trading advice. Uh, disclaimer, not trading advice. Don't use any of this for trading advice or buying any stocks or whatever that I'm saying. Um, so say it did drop down to 70 bucks, you're down $30 on the trade. You can either A, all right, close it. 99% of you will not do that. B, add to it, all right? So what's gonna happen is when you add to it is you're either A, going to average down the cost of it just by buying one more. So say you bought 170, and now you have two contracts, your, your average is somewhere around $80, $85, $90, whatever, all right? So, for example, say you have $90 now, that's what your average buy-in price is, okay? And say the price is still at um, 70 bucks, now you have two contracts, all right? But you're only down on those two contracts, you're down 130, and the other one you're down 20, uh, so whatever the average is going to be, you know, $40, $35, whatever. Um, so what you need to know is that now that you've averaged the position lower cost and you have a high probability per se that this is going to go back to 100, so you're immediately going to make $10 times two. You'll make $20 on the trade, right, if it goes back to 100. If you're into scalping and stuff like that, if you do 10 contracts, they're $90, you average down, they go back to 100, you flip the script real quick, sell them for $10 profit each, Say so you got 10 contracts, you just made $100. It doesn't sound like a big gain, but in trading, you wanna make money, you don't wanna lose money. So in the event that you just kept that one contract, now it's only 70 bucks, 
but it goes back to 90, okay? But you wanted to collect your whole $100, you wanted to have all your money back and break even, it never goes back to 100, your expiration rolls around, boom, you just lost all your money, okay? Those are things you have to think about, all right? So, or maybe not all your money, but the majority of it, right? So, again, this is why I preach long expirations, because if you trade short expirations, which I see in the TCX chat and other chats that I've been in or been in, um, stock twist, God forsaken thing that that is, um, you really, and you just saw a big move here on uh, SPY, right? Um, SPY actually just dropped from, on this one five minute candle, after hours, uh, low of 285.16, and it's currently trading at, uh, looks like 286. Um, now 285.16 is what it's hit. So, what we need to see is, trying to see the volume on this candle, hold on. Well, oh, I don't have the volume on the bottom. So, what we're looking at is just basically an after hours movement. I would not worry about this, um, even though it did technically break below a support area, 285.16. Are we worried about that? I'm not, not personally, um, not yet. Now, if this bounces back up, which generally it will, generally this will just flake back up here to 286, 285 and a half, um, and it will be okay. But the mid Bollinger band is what I'm looking for, right? So the mid band is 287. I am expecting the price to retest, and this is gonna come down. See, there you go. Y'all watch that literally happen live. All right, so 286.87 is literally where you're at where the band touched and told you. All right, so now we got a, a nice bullish motion here, and if it breaks that mid band and comes on back up to 288, we will be beautiful tomorrow. I think the market will open back, at least break even where it was closing, um, a little higher than 286 maybe, 287, 288. Uh, we open back up at 289 or we gap up to 290, that would be beautiful. Um, but let's get back to it. So the premise of the video, principle of the video was, when do you take profit? Let me grab a drink. Um, do you take profit on, do you take profit on a percentage? 10%, 20%, 40%, 50%, 100%. Y'all don't realize how many times 100% can be done in an options trade, right? even on debit spreads, okay? So my goal for the debit spread I have open tomorrow, um, you know, and market movers, you know, big whales basically, or huge funds with, with guys that are real sharp about snagging money out of the market, they will watch this stuff and they will see who has X amount of contracts, like when did this order flow go in for this expiration, how many open interest and volume and all this good stuff. If somebody's got 50,000 contracts themselves, they can easily, you know, affect the market's opinion on where the stock will go. And if they if they bought them at five ten dollars a piece, and they're turning around ready to sell them, and guys start pouring in, or or whoever starts pouring into the trades to get all these open interests and start racking up, say a hundred thousand open interests, well, that cat that bought fifty thousand contracts is probably already out of trade. As soon as he sold them, all right, here we go. I'm gonna try to merge these videos together. I just realized I got cut off. Um, so what those guys are gonna try to do is basically just destroy you with your contracts, right? So. Don't trade short expiration trades unless you A, are very experienced and know the risk, you can handle the risk, you can handle losing the money, or you're, you're so confident that it's going to happen and you can still be wrong that you'll make money on the trade. Even if it's $10, a dollar, whatever. We don't want to break even, we don't want to lose money, we want to at least make a dollar. That sounds stupid to some people, but a 1% return is better than a zero or a negative percent return, all right? And that's just facts, okay? You don't want to go put money in the bank and then you put $150 in there and then they tell you you can only get out 140. Sorry, that's, you know, you don't, you don't want to hear that. All right, so percentage versus dollars, okay? Which one do you choose, all right? Again, it's all variable. It depends on you, all right? All right, say I, say I put $100 in a trade, okay? And you can reference percentage or dollar on this. $100 on a trade, I lose 10 bucks. Do I care? All right, of course I care, I don't wanna lose money, but am I gonna close the trade at, at a 10% loss, uh, 10 bucks, or am I gonna say, you know what, nah man, I'm good with losing $30 on this trade, if it goes down to like, you know, a loss of like 25 bucks, I'll add another contract or even two contracts, and if you average down enough, and you have time on the contract, henceforth why you don't buy short expirations, because if you have all this time, okay, let's do a little timeline for you here, right? Contracts in general, 
All right, if you didn't know this already, contracts in general, they have this huge expectancy in life, right? At the last around 20 to 30, 40 days, they start to do this very quickly. And at the end of expiration, they do this. So you're either right or you're wrong, all right? You don't want to be buying an option here and it's just going to kill on theta value so bad on time decay that you're just losing money on the rip. Unless you buy it here and then it suddenly goes up because of a huge move on the stock, right? That's what you got to know, all right? Now, some of you are probably already thinking it before I'm going to say it. Oh, wait a minute. We want time decay if we're, if we're selling options. And you're absolutely right, all right? So what you want to do, though, and this can be judged on, you know, different opinions. Um, if I'm selling a contract, right? If I'm selling contracts here, um, say my strike, we'll, we'll use Intellistat, all right? That's my, I got 3,800 shares, 38 contracts, selling for $2. My initial uh, average cost, be all the contracts, buying the shares lower, lower, lower to sell, get the premium to put right back in to buy more shares, all right? Lower my average cost down all the way to 114. My break-even price is like 267 or something like that, which I highly doubt will ever touch uh, in my term, but it is a two-year expiration. Why did I do a two expiration selling these calls? Because I get more credit and I'm not worried about the time because any point in that time frame between two months, a year, three months, whatever, it doesn't matter. If two years hits and it doesn't happen, I keep all the credit, I keep all the shares, we're all greedy. But if my average is 114 per share, and I exercise, or get exercise rather, at $2, I don't care about break even. I already kept the credit and put it back into the shares. Okay, so now I'm gonna sell 3,800 shares at $2, so we're looking at a $7,400 return. Did I, did I pay $7,400 for any of this? No, I did not. Did I pay $3,800 for any of this? No, I did not. As I bought the shares, all right, at first it was only 500, and I did a video on this not long ago, you can go back and look, where I showed how I kind of averaged it down. I went from 500 shares, and then one day, because the premium was so high and nice, um, I sold another big trade I had, and then I just started dumping money into it, right? It was like $900. I turned that $900 additional on 500 shares, and ended up with 3,800 shares by the end of the day, okay? That was getting the premium back and all that good stuff. And again, this is a Robin Hood, okay? This is very easy to do. All right, so a lot of people are, you know, talking about, okay, well, why, why are you selling calls? You know, you got to wait to get your money and blah, blah, blah. Okay, first of all, if you're having issues with the brokerage, okay, it could be some restriction on your account. It could be maybe you're on a cash account where you can't do this. Um, so you're just buying shares and all that. You can't sell cover calls and stuff like that without margin. So Robinhood's basic platform, right? Um, all right, real quick, you see how it resisted the 200 uh, mid-band? Um, that's what we're looking at here. So mid-band 287, uh, resisted that a little bit, and that's all good. I'm okay with that. Uh, Robin Hood. Let's go over here. All right. So you can see all my calls here. So I got an OPK. Hopefully you can see this. OPK $2 call, my average share price is $1.50. MFA, $1.67 average. Now, some people are asking me, why did I sell an in-the-money MFA call for a dollar, okay? Well, the, the price has been trending on MFA a little bit, um, but I sold this and collected a $130 premium. Well, the premium is only worth 100 bucks right now, so I'm actually up $30 on the trade. Now, how do I get out of this trade? Because it's a sold position, I have to buy back that position. So I would need to buy back um, this contract for $100. Now, again, I already used $100 for something else, so therefore I gotta come sort of out of pocket for that $100, right? Now, unless you're one of those people who is extremely um, disciplined when it comes to this level, and then you just have all that cash premium sitting there because you plan to flip it quick, which brings us back to the sole calls. Now, I was reading a, a book about this and I was looking at a couple of videos you know, to get other people's opinions based on what I'm thinking. And basic, I mean, trading is, is, a, is a very wide known thing, right? It's not like Johnny and Elroy and, and, and you know, Stratton Oakmont have the best strategies for things. It's about how you use the strategies that you're, you're given, right? So there's so much information people don't even know about trading in the first place, okay? So what you're looking at 
is this is time decay, right? So if I sell a call here, all right, and I collect a $90 premium, okay, credit to my account, when you sell a position, credit spread, sell a call, sell a put, you're collecting a premium, expecting something not to happen or to happen. Now, my, my thing, my position is what I'm writing in the book right now, selling calls for either flipping premium for a profit or selling calls to hopefully get exercised in which you will end up getting more money for your shares. So 3,800 shares, again, $2, 7,400 bucks. I'm, I'm okay with that, I'm good with that. Now what we need to do is say I sold this credit, um, or I sold this call, got this $90 credit. Um, we'll use OPK as an example. Say it's at uh, $2 strike, okay? OPK, we need it to go you know, to whatever to get exercised. That should break even. I am not really concerned with OPK going to $2 and the whole break even situation because I'm gonna take that $90 credit and I'm gonna put it into more shares, okay? So I don't, I'm, I'm not expecting to buy back the credit for, the, for this example, all right? I'm gonna to expect to receive this entire credit and hopefully get exercise on my shares. So, but what's gonna happen is, say my expiration's October, um, you know, October starts here, say my expiration's October 16, all right, 2020, whatever, who cares? Uh, say this is October 1st, all right? So right here, that 30, uh, 15 to 30 days, so you got uh, 15 days from here, say right here about the 30 day mark, so you're about November, uh, what was call it, 20th, just to, just to keep it simple. Uh, November 20, from November 20 to October 1st, that 10 day window is gonna start losing money. Therefore, the implied volatility, or IV, is going to either start going up, depending on where the stock price is. If the stock price is hovering right around, say 190, or 185 or something like that, it's pretty close, IV will actually stay really high. IV is gonna fall off the map right here, okay? Right in this range between like 10, 15 days, IV is just gonna plummet, okay? Now just so we're gonna have the opportunity to buy back this contract that you got $90 for, it might be worth 10 or $20 right here, or 50 or five or whatever. The less the probability is of that strike being hit, and closing in the money, the more this goes away, okay? So the implied volatility, and I've seen numbers with Tesla and Shopify up in the 900% range of implied volatility, which is really crazy uh, considering early last year, I never saw a number higher than 250%, all right? But that's what you wanna do. You're selling premium, putting the probability in your favor because when you're selling these calls, or puts, uh, and we'll talk about selling puts real quick. And this kind of all balances, all right? While you were talking about saving money and, and mitigating risk and you know how do I trade better and stop losing so much and when do I take profit and all that, well, that kind of all can side, right? Because if I want to risk $1,000 on a trade, we'll keep this simple. I want to buy $1,000, say the shares are $1, okay? I got 1,000 shares, all right? Now, 1,000 shares, so I got 1,000 shares. How many contracts can I get with 1,000 shares? 10, all right, 10 contracts. Now say I spent $1,000 on these shares, okay? I have 10 contracts. Say my credit premium, we'll keep it, generally it's about 50%, so we'll say, Say we get $50 per contract, 50 cents, which you'll see, times 100, all right, it's gonna be $50. Say we got $50 per contract, times 10, that's $500, all right? Based on how the premiums are set up that I've seen, unless you go in the money, don't recommend that, don't do that. Don't, don't look at the dollar sign on the credit thinking you're gonna make it out better, and I'll explain why in a minute. Say we got $500 credit. We only paid a dollar for these shares, okay? Say our contracts are again, let's go, let's go $1.50, all right? Do we want these 1,000 shares to exercise at $1.50? Sure, why not? We made 50 cents a share, that's fine. We still kept the credit. Here's where it gets fun. I'm gonna pour all $500 back into these shares, buying 500 more, so now I have 1,500 shares, all right? 
Now I got 1,500 shares because I used all that credit to go right back into the shares, okay? Now, multiply that, $1.50, okay? Now, we're just racking up profit now, okay? So now we got 1,500 shares times $1.50. We're just multiplying here, okay? So, what do we want to do? Do we want to exercise or do we want to let it ride? We want to mitigate our risk. We are, we are efficiently mitigating the risk by lowering the cost of the shares if the price goes down. You don't want to buy more shares even though you got a big credit. You don't want to buy more shares if the stock price is going up. Unless it stays in like a little 5, 10 cent range, that's, a, that's okay. Um, if the price jumps up 60, 75 cents, don't buy any more shares because you're actually raising the average cost, which is not good. You don't want to do that. All right? Um, so let's see. Um, let's go down those MFA. So it gets confusing here because people don't really understand what they're looking at, right? So what we can see here, if you can see this, you've got a positive total return. Market value is negative 212. All right, the credit was 275. So that means I made the difference here. This is my profit. $63. 22% is my actual total return technically on the sold calls. My MFA break even price is 269 per share. So if it closes at 269, I'll technically break even. We don't care about that. I got $68 roughly per credit um, per contract. All right, times four. So that's my grand total here. 275 is what I received. Now, if this expires at zero and MFA never touches $2, and it expires on October 16th or any time before I get exercise, whatever. If it expires on 1016, less than $2, all right, chances are we will not get exercise. Even all the way up to 250 or 260, we won't get exercise in some cases. And what's gonna happen is we're gonna break even on this or we keep our shares and we kept the premium. You are efficiently mitigating risk by not exposing yourself because you have one or two situations of liquid. Right? Go back to the thousand dollar, uh, thousand shares, a thousand dollars. All right. So thousand bucks, thousand shares. Um, and, and remember, you got five hundred dollar credit. So that's a fifty percent of your money, technically, that you don't have to worry about because you efficiently got it back by putting it here. Okay. And now you have fifteen hundred shares. You've effectively raised the favor. Granted. In some cases, some people will say you expose more risk because you have more shares. This goes into the book I'm writing right now. Don't put yourself in shares that you don't want. If you don't want the shares, the shares are garbage, they're going to go bankrupt, whatever the case, don't buy those shares. Don't put yourself in that, in that exposed situation, okay? What you want to do is get shares that are worth the crap, okay? So let's go up. How do we know MFA is, is, is good? Well, we don't. But what we can do is look at the three-month chart right when all this corona stuff started. All right? Dude, in February, you're at like eight, seven. And even right here, when the corona started hitting hard, you still went down to 162, but popped back up on this jump to 432. Okay, that was March 20. That was the initial bull jump, uh, dead cat bounce, whatever you want to call it. All right, but then you touched all the way down here to like 80-something cents. 30, oh, I'm sorry, 35 cents. Jesus Christ. So this, this would have been amazing, right? I wasn't aware of this stock at this point. I actually hit my scanner when I, when I saw this move on my scanner on Fidelity. So what we're looking at, my average cost 178. If I would have bought 1,000 shares at three, 35 cents, dude, that didn't cost me nothing. And then I waited until this guy jumped over here, and now I'm getting 55 or 65 or 75 dollars Credit per contract per hundred shares, dude. I'm making tons of money on this trade. Like I'm already, I'm already good. And then in the event that you know we're over here, because we could have sold the one dollar call, the two dollar call, the one fifty call. Now here's what you need to understand. This is something that that people aren't realizing, and that I probably haven't explained really. Is that okay? Say I bought those shares at thirty five cent. Do I want to sell calls against them, or do I just want to take the profit? It went to two dollars. I quadrupled my investment. Okay, cool. Check this out. You bought them at 35 cents, right? Hopefully my video don't run out of time here. Like 16 minutes, cool. So you bought them at 35 cents, right? The premium for a $2 call then was probably garbage, right? It was probably like five or 10 bucks. Maybe 20 or 30 if you did a really long October expiration, but I doubt it, 
okay? Say you're pondering, right? Okay, I know this is gonna recover. You already are familiar with selling options in the first place. MFA was seven or eight dollars back just a few months ago before the coronavirus started, all right? And all this killed the market, bear market, whatever you wanna call it. We bought at 35 cent, all right? Now they're at 150 per share, okay? At this point, we effectively can sell the $2 call easily for a profit, right? Even if it's only 50 per contract, do we got, say we got 3,500 shares, okay? <laughs> so if you got 3,500 shares at $50 a credit, you got 35 contracts times 50, dude, you just made some money. Like the credit that you're gonna receive from this is just massive, all right? Based on your cost, that didn't really cost you anything. These are the opportunities that scanners actually can help you find without really noticing it. But now, like I said, my scanner picked this up when I put it in because I have certain parameters. Um, 80 cents is actually my low, so of course I didn't see this when it was on the uh, 35 cent range. Because what you gotta understand is when a stock goes that low, the stock exchange hits them with a compliance factor and if they don't get back over a dollar, they could be kicked from the exchange, especially on the New York Stock Exchange. Um, so what we got to do is find opportunities. This is all part of trading, but oh man, you said mitigating risk. That's what you're doing, dummy. So what you want to do is find opportunities. Well, I can't find them on Robinhood. They don't have any scanners. They don't have this. They don't have that. You're absolutely right, man. You're absolutely right. So let's go here. Do some news. All right. Something about Gilead. I don't care. All right. So there's, there's Fidelity Active Trader Pro again. All right. Um, the scanner's not effectively here. It takes you to the website. Let's see if this updates. 640, that's pretty accurate. Um, you can see it's respecting this line on the mid Bollinger Band. Again, third deviation on the Bollinger Bands when I set them. Here, third deviation, all right? Second deviation means the general range that it's gonna move in. So this, if this would have been the second, it would have done like this, and it, it stepped out hard, okay, and then it pushed back in, and then you could have moved this mid band a little higher. But third deviation, 50 day or 50 uh, period average or whatever, that's where you're seeing this. The harder it pushes on a band, if it steps out of the third deviation, there is a huge probability it's going to come back in, all right, and it's going to try to touch this mid band again, or at least slowly ride out a channel back to the mid band. That's just how the bands work. Once this establishes support on top of the mid band, again, this is a five minute candle chart, so we've got to be careful with this. This is intraday only or short scalping. If it, once it posts support on top of this, is it going to necessarily go straight to the top band? No. Is it going to slowly do this number, maybe back to 289, 290? Sure, 100%, in my opinion. But that is generally how they work. Now, if bad news pops back out again and you drop it, Man, you can't do nothing about that. All right, TCX check. Some of you beginners saw you today. Oh, God, Spice tanking. It was doing this. SPY. Boom. A couple of the guys actually called out puts looking for the resistance at 289, right? 289 resistance. So you could have effectively bought puts at 289 for a 295 strike for Friday. You would have done really good right here. You would have made a nice fat chunk of money because this ended up hitting again 285 and some change. Say 285.50. All right, boom. $4, $3.50 move, that's huge. If you had a 295 strike, you just became even more of the money producing return, all right? Huge problem. All right, now, what was the biggest problem here? The biggest problem was not that SPY went down, okay? Because even when SPY dropped all the way like it did, my position at one moment was at negative 73, okay? My position cost $313, all right? So, but I'm only down 73 bucks at that moment. But again, this is what I say, you gotta watch your losses. If you set a trailing stop loss on an option or just a stop limit in general on a price that you don't wanna go under, right? This, chances are, would have hit. Bid ask prices, you open a trade, you got a 10% set on it, especially TOS, TOT, Ameritrade, whatever, and that sucker drops $30, $40 and hits your 10, 15% mark, boom, you're out of the trade. Now, what happened? By end of day, as you saw, we're only negative 58 bucks, okay? Again, my total profit on the trade yesterday on the debit spread day to day. Now, oh, well, you're just breaking even. No, don't get carried away. So, $78 profit, all right? 
Now we're down 58. Had I closed here, I only had a $5 break even profit basically between day one and two, okay? That's stupid. At this moment, all right, I know that I have tomorrow's expiration. It's a debit spread. It's still gonna be above 283 in my opinion. I could be wrong. We can see some huge nasty stuff on the futures late tonight, four o'clock in the morning, East Coast time, and it could get ugly. But in the moment, if this trade pops back up to even a negative $20 loss, okay, and I see that the chart feels like it's confident, and I, you know, I'm liking how it's going, and I feel like it's gonna close in the day around 287 or higher, I'm gonna realize all of the profit on that trade. So it's gonna go from negative 58 back to like 10, 20, $30 profit. Now again, where you open, this is something I learned when I did a Ford one. When you open a debit spread, and debit spreads are effectively for, in my opinion, small accounts or people, you can't do it on a cash account though, or people who like to mitigate risk as a whole, right? Now, oh man, but you kept your profit and blah, blah, blah. Okay, so say, say I made a 50% return on a debit spread that I got at the money on Amazon. Amazon moved like $200. My, my debit spread is now three week expiration. My debit spread is in the money by like 30 bucks. I made a 50% return on say, I don't know, the last one I did was $180. All right, that's how much it cost. Say $180 and I just made 50% on that trade, right? So what we're looking at here, we'll make it even, even more simple here. So I'll just say $200, all right, pay 200 bucks. Pay 50%, so I made $100 on this trade, okay? So I made $100, so I'm at 300 bucks, okay? Say I did that times 10 contracts, okay? Now I got $2,000, all right? So we got two grand, 10 contracts, all right? And now we made 100, uh, I'm sorry, 50%, so we made $1,000, all right? Boom, you just closed out $1,000 on a trade that cost you two grand, okay? You mitigated risk, you protected yourself from uh, additional downside because if you buy one strike at 285 by itself and it drops to 284, you just lost a dollar worth of mo uh, movement on that, so effectively $100. And depending on what the theta is and all that good stuff, all those things factor in. All right, why do debit spreads? Well, when you contract up on debit spreads, yes, you increase your risk, but you also increase your profit. But guess what you did by using a debit spread? You made a protective channel, okay, that your cost is gonna be. So my spy calls on this debit spread, got an end my throat's getting dry over here. Uh, spy calls 287, 283, okay? It's a $400 spread, all right? Again, if you didn't know this, the distance between these, times 100, $4 times 100, all right? That is 400 bucks. I paid 313, I can effectively make um, $87 on this trade, profit-wise, right? So that's what we're looking for, between 15 and 20-something uh, percent there. Um, so what we're looking at is, do I wanna go all the way to max this out? Sure, if it closes, like if it's 290 tomorrow, getting near the end of the day, I'll probably just leave it alone. Or I can go ahead and close the position and make and take the money off the market, all right? Because here's what can happen. Just like end of day here, this happened right at the end of the day. Say I looked at my phone, or my, my account or whatever right here. This man, this trade is beautiful, man. We're at 289. Man, we're about to close in the money. It's gonna be beautiful, but it's a Friday or Wednesday, whatever, whatever your expiration date is. So I got this window here, right? But here's what I was gonna say. I actually bought this position, again, at the 300 dollars mark. We can go back and look at the clock if you want. All right, it was around two, I think it was 288.50, okay? And I, because I wanted to see how low it came down. That's when it cost me 313. And now the position again is worth like 255. Okay, cool, no big deal, whatever. I am still going to be safe with this money here if the price stays right where it's at, at 285 plus. Okay, now granted, we saw what it went down to, it was like 78 bucks lost, but then it went back up. I bought it at 289, that was worth the stock price, 28.50, whatever. Okay, I would actually need it to go back to this range give or take implied volatility. Um, if it went past 288.50, I would either I, uh, sorry, either A, be broke even, or I would be making just a little bit of profit. When it touched back here at 289.25, I think my trade was up like 13 or $18, right? Real small percentage uh, return, but it's all good. 
because here's what we're doing. We've mitigated this entire section for our risk. If we drop down to 283, okay, still closing the money. We lost all the value on this here. Well, it's going to hurt our trade. We're not going to walk away with 255. If you let it close, you'll walk away with probably around 180 bucks, right? Give or take, could be even less, could be like 90. Uh, it depends on how much you pay for this and this set off. Okay, so say this was uh, 200. Um, oh, here, let's do this. So say this was a $410 trade, and this was uh, this credited you, you know, 100, you know, whatever, whatever the 100 difference is. All right, and then you got 313. So that's your difference there. So if you already lost $100 value, now you're eating away at your 400. Okay, and what you want to happen. What we want to happen, I and mean, we see this right here happening live, right? So, good thing about Wheat Bulls, it goes all the way at 8 o'clock. All right, so we're sitting at uh, 18.50 right now, military time, 6.48 p.m. East Coast. Um, we want to be back here above 285. Now, let me get back to this, this point. All right, if the trade is back where we bought it at, right, or at a little bit profit, or say the price opens up at 290, all right, say spy gaps up to 290 in the morning, opens uh, we got a limit sell at 350 or 370 or something like that we are already at 287 we are three dollars in the money okay that's what you need to realize you're three dollars in the money that is excellent okay what's going to happen if at the end of the day we get this motion here because jay powell comes on the fed and it's like yo this is what's going to happen we're not going to pump no more money for the next month or two okay well, boom, price drops down, it's 350, you know, market's about to close, price drops to like 284. Man, you just lost all that money in between that you had gained, okay? Say 287, 290, say you're, you're profitable at 360, 375, 380 right now, uh, total position against $400, so you will not go over that. But say 380, your limit sale didn't quite hit, because you're like, man, it's cool, three, limit sale's in there, but I'll let it expire, it's all good. End of the day, 3.50 p.m. happens. j Powell comes on. Now nah, we ain't helping no more. 284, closing spy price. Yes, you're still above your 283, okay, that you bought. But all of this value, remember it cost you around 400 bucks. All of that value is, is gone. You only helped yourself by $100 by selling that other one. But it's still a directional trade. It's sideways, but it's directional. You want it to continue at a nice incline Okay, to where you actually close with a profit. When SPY was at 289 at the end of the day there, before it dropped off, I was profitable. Okay, that's what you need to realize. This is effectively mitigating risk as a whole. Now, back to the principle. Do we cut losses at a percentage or do we cut losses at a, um, a dollar amount? Well, the question of that is up to you, all right? Do you want to lose money or do you want to make money? That's all there is to it. Um, if you wait until you're at a loss, if you're using uh, triggered stop losses and things like that on your options, you will effectively lose more money by using stop losses, in my opinion, and even some other professional opinions, because they even lower it down to like 1%. If you lost 1% on a trade, you're already wrong. Why, why continue? Why go to 2 or 3, 4, 5, 6, 10%? And that makes sense, right? I mean, I think so, because maybe, maybe you're wrong. Maybe you're wrong. You got ten grand in your account. You're cutting losses. Eventually, you'll be down here somewhere. Because oh, um, I was up and I cut a loss, and I went up and I cut a loss. All right. Effectively, you're going to be up and then you cut losses, up, cut losses, up, cut losses. Even if this is a smaller movement, like this here, eventually you will most likely lose more money. That's all for today. I appreciate you guys. Hopefully this helps somebody. Have a go. Real Fisher Trader out.